Hello gamers and welcome back to another video here on Solo Spelunking and today I would like to make a little um, product showcase video if you will in a shameless act of self-promotion because what you see here is a working copy you can see here I already changed something a working copy of my newest star dark inspired shadow dark project which will be similar to my explorers of the untamed wilds game which will be a like i like to call them board RPG game set in the Star Dark universe using the Shadow Dark rule set. So um, maybe you remember my game Outlaws in the Outer Fringe, where I also did like three episodes here on this channel playing this game. And this is basically. Yeah, a solo but also multiplayer competitive board game using the Seafoys um, engine or 2D6 task resolution system where you have to acquire 10 fame while performing yeah, free, freelancer spacer tasks in the outer fringe. Of course, also this is a Star Wars inspired game. Uh, inspired by the professionally produced board game The Outer Rim, which I also own, but which I find very slow paced if you play it with like four or five persons. Um, as I have mentioned on this channel before, I am lucky that I still have a gaming group and I've been with this gaming group at least with the core members of this group for over a decade now, as a matter of fact. Um, two of these members of this group also attended my wedding and I'm uh, married 14 years now and we have known each other also before that. So I've known these guys a long time. Um, we got to know each other playing the Star Wars miniatures game and from that we went on to playing Star Wars scenarios with our miniatures using our or my um, solo rules that I created. Created them way back then for this group. And we played lots of things. We played the Star Wars living card game and we played um, the um, X-Wing miniatures game. I didn't like that one too much also because I think it was pretty slow paced if you play it with a lot of people. And so we tried out all kinds of stuff. Currently we're playing an Imperial Assault campaign and the expansion, the Lothal expansion, I don't know what, what it's called. Um, we're almost done with that. So I'm lucky that I still have a gaming group even though we don't play in person as much as I like and when the Outer Rim came out the professionally produced board game we played that I think we've played it a total of maybe three or four times now but we're always like four I think sometimes we were even five persons and this game, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a fun game if you play it solo. I've played it solo using my own solo rules, sort of like as a hand solo simulator. But if you play it with like four or five people, it takes forever until your turn comes up again. And then you have a short turn, but you have very little player agency, at least in my opinion. And it's just very slow paced if you play it with a lot of people and and your thoughts just wander off because it takes forever. So long story short, I'm not really satisfied with that game when it comes to group play because it is slow paced. But when I first um, read about The Outer Rim, I thought, hmm, would be great to have some sort of board gamey, hand solo simulation style Star Wars game 
So I did a fan version of it, or I made a fan version of it that we play tested with my group. And this is basically a modified result of that. Um, this outlaws in the outer fringe game. And um, But why am I telling you this? Well, because as you might have noticed watching my previous videos, I'm at the moment, this might change, I'm very fond of the Shadow Dark system. I like its elegant simplicity, as I like to call it. And whenever I like a system, I look for ways to play Star Wars with it. So I came up with my Star Dark uh, supplement. And now um, I wanted to basically you know, not take this further, but take this in a little different direction. And I using the Shadow Dark rule set with elements of my Star Dark supplement to create a similar game to Outlaws in the Outer Fringe using the Star Dark system. So in its current version, it's just called Star Dark Adventures in the Outer Fringe. This is an early working draft. Um, it has been changed quite a bit. Um, from from this version here um, but I also incorporated of course lots of elements from Outlaws and the Outer Fringe um, because why reinvent the wheel but I converted it to Shadow Dark slash Star Dark and I implemented um, rules from my supplement but I adapted them to to play this as a board game style game and the difference to Outlaws and the Outer Fringe is that this is not meant to be played competitive. This is meant to be played either solo or cooperatively with a group where everybody controls a character, but you don't want anybody to be the GM. So like I like to call these, this will be a solo role-playing framework but similar to my game Explorers of the Untamed Wilds it is not completely free form it's not a classic role-playing game this is why I call this a role-playing board game because it has a set structure you play it in rounds every round has different phases you have predetermined encounters you have pre uh, determined actions that you can take but you get to collect experience points you get to create a character in the beginning and you basically have a lot of player agency meaning you can choose what you want to do so like let's if I want to go back to to the outer rim something I don't like about the outer rim if I want to play a smuggler which I usually want to do and I want to make my my fame as it's called on that game smuggling illegal cargo I have to wait for illegal cargo to show up on the um, this cargo stack where you can buy cargo and of course I have to hope that if my turn comes up it's still there and not someone else bought it so, and this is what I mean with player agency. If my turn comes up and I would like to smuggle illegal cargo, but there's no cargo available, I got to do something else. And I mean, doing stuff that does not give you fame doesn't really make sense in this game. And here in this game, you can just decide to buy illegal cargo if you manage to make contact with the underworld. You don't have to wait for some random card to show up. This is what I mean with, with player agency. So, um, yeah, um, like I said, this is basically like a hybrid um, from or, or combining a board game and a role-playing game. And here also, because you've got to have some sort of goal, but you play this cooperatively. Here also the goal is to collect, just like an Outlaws in the Outer Fringe, to collect Renown, 10 Renown, without dying. And whenever you get one point of Renown, every character also gets two experience points, so you can also advance your characters during the adventures. And you can also use your money to carouse, to, to get more experience points. 
And in the current version of this game, I implemented the star dark options that you need directly into this, this booklet. So you can play this game with just this booklet. And this is why it's here. You only need the shadow dark um, quick start rules that are free. And um, I printed them out. I combined the player and the GM quick start and combined it into one book and had it printed. But uh, of course you can just use the PDF. And that you only need this to get a basic understanding of the shadow dark rules if you haven't played shadow dark before. And with this basic understanding of the rules and you need some things here like the ancestries and with this booklet you can play a board game style um, Star Wars adventure using Shadow Dark. And I will showcase this gameplay in this video maybe like the first two, three, four rounds, maybe um, collect one or two renown, we will see, just to give you an idea of this product so um, that you can decide if this is something you might be interested in. So I will put this up uh, on drive-thru RPG, so um, I will not be giving this away for free, I'm sorry, but I do put a lot of of work and effort in these products and I spent a couple of hours um, typing, retyping, generating art and stuff. Um, so, but it will be pretty cheap. So I, I keep all my things below four bucks. So I think it'll be like 349 or something depending on the final page count. Um, but it's still in the works. So um, I'm going to showcase it here if it's anything or something you are interested in, in trying and um, yeah so um, without further ado I will I will leave this here for the encounter tables but I will also get my tablet where I have the current um, working uh, not working but the current um, version of this game and um, I will get the PDF up. Mm, come on. Yeah, all right. So this is the, the actual uh, version of it right now. It's called Stardark Adventures in the Outer Fringe. And it's a space opera sandbox role-playing board game of smugglers, outlaws, mercenaries and bounty hunters on the fringes of a war-torn galaxy using the Shadow Dark RPG rules and elements from the Star Dark supplement. And I even added um, a um, table of contents here that is hyperlinked um, and did some introductory flavor text, the game overview, and uh, what exactly is this. Here I explained it as I did in my Explorers of the Untamed Wilds. That is like a combination of a role-playing and a board game because it features a set structure, predefined encounters, movement on a board, but also character development, acquisition of experience points, and character customizability. So then it goes into detail how to set up the game and how to create your hero. And this is where it gets interesting because I incorporated the classes from Stardark, but only the um, Scoundrel and the Soldier class. And I adjusted them a little because this game is structured. So what I did is there will be only six backgrounds in this game that you can roll randomly with 1d6 or choose. And every background gives you special abilities that refer to actions you can do in the game. So with those two classes in combination with those six backgrounds, you can create pretty uh, varied characters. Um, just to give you an idea, let's just take the first background here, the smuggler background. 
smuggler, it states you can get anything anywhere. You have advantage when trying to make contact with the criminal underworld. So if you want to make contact with the underworld, you got to make a check. You have advantage when performing the evade maneuver. And the evade maneuver is a maneuver you can do at the beginning of space combat to try to avoid the space combat. It's basically like a pilot check modified by the speed difference between the two vessels. And you get a 10% discount on the purchase price of illegal cargo. However, this does not stack with a discount on a metropolitan trade hub world because there you always get a 10% discount. So that's the smuggler. And now let's take, for example, the gambler. You are an expert at bluffing, deceiving and reading people and know your way around a casino. When gambling, this is an activity you can do in this game, you roll the check with advantage. And now your winnings are increased by 10% and your losses are decreased by 10%. So for example, if you bet a wager of 500 and win, you win 550 credits. But if you lose, you only lose 450 credits. And because you're good at bluffing, deceiving and reading people, you also have advantage on all checks to avoid military entanglements on a planet. So this is when they, when you're wanted and they want to check your ID. And uh, one more example, let's take the bounty hunter background. You are feared in the criminal underworld and always get your query. You have advantage on checks to investigate the location of a bounty target. And now I think an interesting part. When fighting a wanted criminal or bounty target, these are encounters that can happen, you roll damage in personal combat with advantage. Only against wanted criminals or bounty targets and you get a 10% increase on bounty values. So See these uh, backgrounds, they're a little bit more fleshed out than backgrounds uh, in, in the Stardark supplement or Shadow Dark, where it's open to, to player interpretation because this is not a real role-playing game. It's like a hybrid game. But I think these backgrounds, they, they invoke a flair or, or an image. And, and these backgrounds in combination with your character class, they make for varied characters. And I also adjusted the character classes a bit. So here you can play scoundrels or soldiers. And the scoundrel, um, yeah, I mostly adapted this from Stardark, but with slightly different, or the abilities work slightly different. So scoundrels luck works just like it does in Stardark. But here, since you play in rounds, it says you start each round with a luck token. At the start of the movement phase, and this is the first phase in a round, your luck tokens refresh and you gain a luck token if you do not already have one. And the expert knowledge uh, works like this in this game, that you start with two backgrounds instead of one. Even if you use the option of choosing a background, you can only choose one background. The other one must be rolled randomly. Doubles are re-rolled. So to not make it too powerful in the characters I am playing right now, I created them randomly. I just rolled the backgrounds randomly. I didn't choose. So this is why, why scoundrels... Uh, like they usually have in role-playing games, still have a wide variety of skills in this game. And the soldier is, of course, the combat uh, character. So they can use all weapons, all armor or shields. They get more hit points and they have um, slightly altered abilities. They have weapon expert. So this is as weapon mastery in Shadow Dark, but without the damage bonus for half level, but you still get the initial plus one damage. They have deadly attack. You probably know this from Stardark, so they score a critical hit. When making a weapon attack roll of 18 to 20, uh, the table is the same as in Stardark, but the grit feature I replaced with die hard. 
and it says when you are at zero hit points you roll with 2d4 plus con when determining your death timer instead of rules as written in shadow dark 1d4 so these are the classes and you combine them with backgrounds and you have a starting ship and um, yeah and your goal is you play as a crew as a party as a crew uh, with joint ownership of a ship and the goal is just to get 10 renown to establish yourself as major players in this sector where you play in and the sector is created randomly uh, using the same rules that are also in effect already in my game outlaws in the outer fringe and here it states the objective checks how the round works combat and i took part of the starship rules from stardark and basically modified them slightly for this game so this is a complete game in itself you you do not need star dark to play this you just need the shadow dark complete quick start or quick start rules for free and this booklet and you got all the rules you need in this booklet so i added some uh, spaceship rules that you need the evade maneuver is explained and um, the different uh, combat actions and then it goes on to detail the different world types there are four in this game and finally it details all the planetary actions that you can take and it has the encounter and job tables for deep space encounters and planetary encounters and so, yeah, this is just an overview. I will just uh, play a couple of rounds so that you can see how this works in practice. And for the encounter tables, because they haven't changed much, I will use this booklet because it's easier to flip through here than using the PDF. I usually like to, to print out my, my products. All right, so... Um, yeah, I, of course, already created a sector for this little demo game. This is the card Merrick sector. And in this game, you use a hex template. And I, there's a link to this template in the product. This is free, also from DriveThruRPG. And then you randomly place 12 systems by rolling the coordinates. And then you roll what kind of world types they are. There are four different ones. Unremarkable dumps, metropolitan trade hubs, systems under military blockade, and wretched hives of scum and villainy. And they all have some, uh, they have different encounter tables, but they also have um, different rules. Like, for example, in a trade hub world, you get a 10% discount on most purchases. In a wretched hive, it's easier to make contact with the underworld. On a planet under military blockade, it is harder to make contact with the underworld. And in an unremarkable dump, it is harder to get anything because they don't have much. Repairs are more expensive and so on. And so um, there's a random system name generator in this booklet, a little simple one, just uh, two syllables. You roll them with 2d12 if you don't want to come up with names yourself. And um, so you can generate the names and you need the numbers to roll diff uh, random targets for jobs or bounty locations. So those systems are numbered 1 to 12, 12 systems, and they have a name and the world type is in parentheses. And my characters are my beautiful female scoundrel Vanessa Rill. She is from, because she's a scoundrel, I got to roll two backgrounds and I rolled them randomly and they were exactly what I wanted and imagined. So she is a gambler and a smuggler. So she's the pilot. Um, and she uh, wears light armor integrated in her padded leather jacket 
and she's got a med kit and a DL44 heavy blaster. So I'm playing in a Star Wars universe, so this is the outer rim actually. And as her talents, and I rolled two talents because of the human ancestry rolls. I got two rolls on her talent tree. I got plus one range damage and I got plus one luck tokens for my scoundrel's luck ability. So I put the two in parentheses. So she's got two luck tokens that refresh every round. And here I put down the benefits she gets because of her background that I rolled. So this is Vanessa Rill. And this is Kel Ozen, also of course one of my stereotype smugglers. And he, I rolled backgrounds mechanic, which sort of fits because he knows his way around starships as well. And he acts usually as the gunner and co-pilot on their vessel. But I also rolled up the background of bounty hunter, which does not really fit. But in my explanation, it is so that he worked as a space hand uh, for hire on, on freighters or docks. And then... Um, he either quit or got laid off. Then he made some money as a bounty hunter, um, basically hunting small-time criminals. Then he met uh, Vanessa, and actually they're a couple. So Vanessa is his girlfriend, and he met Vanessa, and they hooked up. Vanessa had a starship. Uh, she worked as a smuggler. So he, uh, because of his knowledge of, of starship mechanics... And um, so he basically joined her crew or, or signed up on her spaceship. And now they're traveling through the Outer Rim together with their starship. And this is how these characters are connected to each other. So he has got a normal blaster pistol and I rolled for his talent tree plus one range damage two times. So he deals 1d6 plus two damage. He's got similar stats. And um, yeah, so we are basically all set up and ready to go. And these are the miniatures that I will be using um, because... To resolve combat, you use the normal Shadow Dark rules. For space combat, you use the Star Dark rules, which are included in the supplement. And um, I will play out combat, I think, on a grid, if it, if it comes to that. And you, you start the game by rolling your random starting location with 1d12, and you track your movement on this map. And this doesn't count. I always have to roll inside my tray. So four. We start on four. Four is um, Cart Terra. And it's a metropolitan trade hub. That is actually great. So I will get out a little token to track my position on this map. We will just use this wooden cube. So we are in the car Terra system. And it is recommended, it also says it in the booklet, that you use some sort of little notebook or something to, to track important information. And it's also good to have some sort of um, um, tokens or so to, to mark bounty locations or whatever. So uh, I need luck tokens. So Vanessa, she's got two because because of her scoundrel's luck times two ability. So these are luck tokens. And Kel Ozen, he only has one, because this is the standard uh, scoundrel ability. So these blue tokens are luck tokens that refresh at the start of every round. And to track my actions, I made this little card. So a round has a movement phase, an encounter phase, and then in the action phase, you can take up to four actions uh, that you can distribute as you want between your characters. But every character can attempt every action only once. So if he attempts an action that requires a skill check and it fails, he can't take the same action again. However, the other character could, could do this. And I will use this red token to track... Um, 
to track my actions when we get to the action phase. All right, so we are in the trade hub system of Cartera. So a trade hub system, let me just read it to you real quick. So Metropolitan Trade Hub World Type has the following rules. A trade hub system is highly populated. Usually most of the planet surface is taken up by one huge urban sprawl. So the classic Narshada Coruscant, often with several layers. The trade up system features well stocked and large starports, and major galactic corporations have offices there. And now the rules part. While on a trade up system, you get a 10% discount on all cargo, illegal cargo, gear, weapon, and ship modification purchases, as well as repairs. So, this is the place to be if you got stuff to repair. So now we start the first round. So at the start of every round, there's a movement phase, which is completely optional. During this movement phase, you can move around this hex map and you can move as much hexes as your ship has hyperspeed. And the starting ship has a hyperspeed of four. So you could move four hexes. However, and this is how I implemented the astrogation or navigation mechanic, before you move, you can make an intelligence check, DC 12, and for every point above 12, you increase your speed for this round by one. So, um, depending on how good you roll, um, you can get some more speed out of your vessel. And of course, you can upgrade your ship as well. So that is optional movement. So I will not move because I'm in a, on a system where I want to be because here it is, everything is pretty cheap. So the next thing is encounter phase and the encounter phase is mandatory. This is basically where the non-controllable action happens. And this works like so. If you did not move, you roll on the encounter table for the world type you're on with 1d12. And if you just arrived in a new system, you will roll with 1d20. And this is because the encounters 1 to 12 are always ground-based encounters and 13 to 20 are also space encounters. So when you didn't move, it is assumed that you are already on the planet going about your business. So you will only have planetary encounters. But if you have just arrived in a system, you could also encounter something on your approach in space. So this is why then you will use a d20. So we have to roll. Encounter phase is mandatory with 1d12 on the encounter table for the Metropolitan Trade Hub to see what happens. It's a 12. All right, so 12, Encounter Table, Metropolitan Trade Hub. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Here, Metropolitan Trade Hub, Encounter 12. Oh, this looks interesting. Corporate Delivery. A corporate representative approaches you. They need a pilot on short notice, not tied to the corporation. They want to keep this under rugs, basically. To deliver a load of legal but delicate cargo. They ask you to deliver 2d6 units of legal cargo to the D12 system. So this is what you determine randomly. Payment is 500 credits per unit of cargo on delivery. And I just see, I got to adjust this because this is um, not the right price anymore. It's only 150 credits per unit, but it's also cheaper to buy. And I got to check this in, in the other document. All right, so 150 credits per unit of cargo on delivery. You can only accept the contract if you have enough cargo capacity to transport the entire batch. 
All right, so this shouldn't be a problem because my um, starting Starship, it's like modeled after the YT series, has 100 tons or 100 units of, of cargo space. So this just gets interesting if you have more money and you just buy your cargo. All right, so basically I get 2d6 units of cargo that we have to deliver if we want. So this is optional. And uh, yeah, they would pay us 150 credits per unit of cargo for the delivery. I think we don't have to think about this, so we will do this. And if you wanted to, you could, of course, then play this out a little. So if you want to use this more as a corporate, uh, not corporate, cooperative board gaming effort, you could maybe like play out a little scene and um, so this is a demo gameplay but maybe I will do this sometime in the future so let's determine how much cargo we have to transport and where to six tons all right that'll be 900 credits six tons and where to five to the unremarkable dump system of telra ruck all right so now and this is now you could either this is what i will do you could either use one of these little punch out tokens but um one second i will also use a small little a small little um notebook much smaller than my usual ones because yeah because this is only this is not like a real role-playing game where you have to document stuff so i will just use this little notebook and just make a little note that we have a job six cargo six legal cargo in parentheses I put 150 unit to number five all right so this is all I need to jot down and now we go into the action phase and in the action phase um, we can take up to four planetary actions basically and combined we have 350 credits and um, so we could buy some additional legal cargo to make the trip worthwhile or we could just um, gamble a little um, so let's see planetary actions hmm we could try to also get a job locate a bounty target yeah we will do a couple of things so that you um, see what is possible all right so um we can buy legal cargo you can buy legal cargo for 100 credits per ton up to your ship's free cargo capacity and um, legal cargo sells for 150 credits per ton this is why i had to adjust it on any planet other than the planet it was purchased on and selling cargo is a separate action see below and on a metropolitan trade hub you get a 10 percent price discount when you buy legal cargo so we will buy three additional tons of legal cargo for 300 credits. However, because of our 10%, we only pay 270 credits. All right, so we buy three, so plus three legal cargo for 270 credits. So I'm paying because I still got 300, so I'm at 30 credits. So Kel Ozen pays for the cargo. 
And now we have nine units of legal cargo. And that was our first action. So I'm going to track this here. Action number one. So action number two. To gamble we need at least a hundred credits. Minimum wager. But we don't have that now. We only have 80. So we can't gamble. We do not have enough money to buy illegal cargo. We don't have... Oh yeah, we, we still... We could... No, we only have 80, so we need 90. So we can't buy any more legal cargo. We can't um, buy gear because we do not have money. So what we do is we will try to locate a bounty target. This states, you investigate the location of a wanted criminal. Succeed on a DC-12 charisma, intelligence or wisdom check. So this is always the player's choice. If you succeed, you gain the information that a wanted criminal hides in the D12 system. Place a bounty token at the target system, which can be the system that you are currently on as well. Only you are aware of the bounty location. So I gotta still uh, reword this. This is because I took this from Outlaws of the Outer Fringe and this is when you play competitively. And only you can fight the bounty. Separate action, see below. So, um, because I was a bounty hunter, I make use of my bounty hunter talent which or a background which says um, I have advantage to locate bounty targets. Um, I got to double check this because I did not put this on my character sheet, but I'm pretty sure. So let's go back here to the backgrounds. And Bounty Hunter, you have advantage on checks to investigate the location of a bounty target. Yeah, so this is what we're doing. So I got advantage, so I'm rolling 2d20 and I'm adding my charisma modifier of plus 2 and I need a 12. And this is action number 2. And if I fail, I can't attempt this action again. But I do not fail, I roll a 14. So, um, yeah, I do some streetwise talking and in system number 9... That's a wretched hive of scum and villainy that fits in the card mart system. There's a bounty target here. So I will use a, a red... Um, do I have a red um, cube here? No, but a little red, little red die. So I use this. That was action number two. You do not have to use all your actions. So, um, yeah, um, I will or we will not use any more actions. We will skip the rest of the actions and then get moving. So in the next round, now if I would have used my luck tokens, um, they would refresh. So this becomes relevant in combat or when during jobs where you have to make a lot of checks. Um, there, this can be helpful. And um, and now, so we need to move and we need to go to the um, to the uh, Telra Rock system, which is pretty far away. System number five. So. Um, Vanessa, she's piloting, doesn't matter because we both have average intelligence. So I'm making a DC 12 intelligence check and for every point above 12 I get to add some movement to my hyperspeed of 4, my initial hyperspeed of 4. Ugh, epic fail. Alright, so no, um, no additional movement, so I can just move four hexes. One, two, three, four. All right, so that was movement. Now encounter phase. So now I'm in deep space. In deep space, you roll encounters with 1d8. 
because there's not much happening and you can't obviously take planetary actions in deep space. All right, a one. One is uh, not so good. And counter tables are here. Deep space and counter table, role number one. That is a navigational hazard. Your hyperspace safety cuts in and throws you out of hyperspace as you encounter some navigational hazard. It could be an iron storm, asteroids, a mass shadow, debris field, whatever. Succeed at the DC-15 pilot check or suffer 1D6 hull damage. All right, so a pilot check. In a pilot check, just like in Star Dark, you can choose if you use your dexterity modifier, your intelligence modifier, or your wisdom modifier, and you would add the handling of the vessel to the roll as well. So the Star Dark vessel has no handling, plus zero. I'm using dexterity plus three, so I need to make a DC-15 pilot check. And this is where luck might come in handy. DC-15 pilot check. Uh, Vanessa is piloting and when you have to make a check you gotta pick one character of your crew to make the check so you can't circle through basically and that's a fail so I'm using my luck token because I got enough of them and that's a success I rolled a 17 so thanks to the luck token I do not use uh, or take any hull damage so that was the encounter phase. Now the action phase does not happen in deep space, only on a planet. So we start the next round with movement. At the start of the round, the luck tokens refresh and we get to make another intelligence check. DC 12, Vanessa is rolling to see if we can add some movement. Yes, it's a 20, so that is plus eight. Uh, yeah, because uh, the 12, you got to be above, so 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, yeah, plus 8. So that's plenty. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You could also go through the systems. So we arrive in the Telra Rook system. Now, encounter phase, and since we just arrived, and this is an unremarkable dump, we have to roll with the d20 because maybe there's a space encounter happening. 11. No, 11 is a planetary encounter, so that means we land without any, without any difficulties on this unremarkable dump of a planet. And we are lucky again. So unremarkable dump. Encounter number 11. It's a job offer. A local offers you a job. Roll on the job table that has to be completed on this planet. So where we are because they are happy that they found an outside expert. You can choose to accept the offer and attempt the job as an action during the action phase. So and here once again you could role play this out a little. So I already got this picture in my mind. So we we just landed. We get out of our vessel. And um, yeah, and then we are approached by a guy or girl in a hooded cloak. And he goes like, we do not get visitors often. Are you interested? on a little lucrative job opportunity or for a little lucrative job opportunity. Oh, and that is exactly this is the big heist. So job number eight. So there are eight different jobs that are generic and job number eight is the big heist. You are hired as part of a larger crew for a big heist that requires all your skill. So it'll be a difficulty of 14 for all the checks and we need to complete a couple of um, ability checks in order and we have to complete them all before we get three failures. And if we complete this job, we get three points of renown because it's such a difficult job and a lot of money. 
so um, yeah so he explains us that he's got this grand plan scheme and that he um and that's got to be completed here on this planet and that he needs uh some competent outside help for this grand scheme of his and since we do not have anything to lose because if you fail a job you can lose renown actually because your reputation is hurting but i do not have any renown at the moment so it's minimum zero so i basically can only gain something from this job i can't really lose anything so we accept so um we accept the big heist um on this planet so we do this in the action phase except because and you can only have one job at a time so we now we can't take another job unless we either complete or fail this one so um yeah so that was the encounter phase now action phase and everything is an action so also the the attempt to complete this job is an action so if I want to do it this round without going through another encounter, um, I would uh, leave have to leave one action. So the first action will be to deliver the cargo. So this is actually an action. It's called deliver cargo and disembark passengers. Some encounters give you the opportunity to transport someone else's cargo like we did. Or to transport passengers. Use this action to deliver the cargo or disembark the passengers once you arrive at the target destination. So we unload the six units of legal cargo that we got from the job and so we get plus 900 credits. I will add this shortly and then as our second action because these are different actions we sell legal cargo and since it's legal cargo there's nothing really that is to just sell it so sell legal cargo you can sell your legal cargo on any planet other than the planet it was purchased obviously for 150 credits per ton so we bought three tons so um, that's another 450 credits 450 yeah, so we actually gained 1,350 credits for delivering this cargo and completing our delivery. So this is what we did. So I will put the money in the account from Vanessa because she's got 50 so she's got a round number now of 1400 credits and that were two actions all right now three action number three Vanessa since she's a gambler background she will gamble action number three she will gamble and she can wager up to 10,000 credits. That's the maximum in 100 credit increments. And she will wager a thousand credits. All right, so that's action number three. Wager a thousand. And now she's got to make a DC 15 um, wisdom or charisma check. She will choose wisdom. She's got plus two and she has to make a DC 15 check to try to win her wager. But the good thing is, oh, she's got advantage because she's a gambler and she's got luck tokens. So actually she's good at gambling and she also needs to be good because that's an eight plus two. That would be a failure. So I'm using one of her luck tokens. Ah, but then again, I do not have luck tokens left for the job. Uh, but otherwise, I would lose 900 because of the 10% uh, 
So I gotta, I gotta, I already spent my luck. I gotta do it again. I gotta win. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. That's a 12 plus 2. That is a 14. Ah, that is a 14. And by Shadow Dark rules as written, you can only spend one luck token on a roll. Let me recheck this. Um, that means, sadly, well, I will have a luck token left for the job, but I think luck, oh, here, yeah, luck tokens, yeah. Um, you can cash in a luck token to reroll any roll you just made. You must use the new result. Yeah, all right, but it says every player can have only one luck token at a time, and but this is her special ability. She can have two. So I figure she can also use to, otherwise it, um, yeah, it's nice to have, but so because she is a gambler, so she will use her last luck token, meaning she won't be able to use it during the job. Uh, and of course, four and five, it's a gamble. So I lost, but thankfully, because I am a gambler, I get a 10% discount on my loss. So even though I wagered a thousand, I'm only losing 900. So I am at 500 credits. And that was my third action. And now with the last action, we will try to play our part in this job. And how this works is you just make the skill checks. And this is, that's the only thing that is not good if you use a system without skills, because in Outlaws of the Outer Fringe, there were skills. So you had to make different skill checks for the cinematics. And now I had to convert the skill checks into ability checks. So if it says like here, a charisma check, this is like deceiving, bluffing people. And then a dexterity check is like sneaking. A strength check might be climbing, but you don't really get this, this feel um, if you don't stretch your imagination a little of what you're actually doing in this job. But I think those of us who play solo games and watch these channels, I think we are creative enough to come up with... Um, something in our minds to fill out these blanks. All right, so um, I'm already again almost at an hour. So this job will be the last action for today for this little gameplay demo. And um, yeah, so let's see. So uh, we have we are in the big heist. And the first thing um, we need is a charisma check because we need to smooth talk our way maybe like this is a casino heist or whatever and um, um, we will I will use Kel Ozen because he's got charisma bonus plus two I was just thinking um, she has advantage on roads for imperial entanglements but this is not it this is a job so we got to stick stick to the rules. So it's a plus two and uh, the difficulty is 14. Oh, natural 20. All right. So I'm thinking now that I rolled a 20, if I would implement the rule just like in my skill challenges, like that a 20 counts as two checks, but then again, a one would also count as two failures. So I guess I'm just, yeah, but you know, if you play a d20 system, you don't really want a 20 to go to waste, actually. But if you roll a one, it would also suck. No, I will just leave it as it is. Um, so um, yeah, we, we did the first check. Now dexterity, uh, we have to sneak sneak into some place. We both have plus three, so it doesn't really matter. Now Vanessa. No, um, Kel, because he's still got his luck token. Dexterity, 14. 
And there we need the luck token. I'm using the luck token to re-roll. We're still sneaking. It's an 18, yes. <laughs> but we're not done sneaking. We still got to sneak another dexterity check. Nine, so that's the first failure. So every job has like these failure circles, but you could also use, of course, scrap paper. Um, but I will just use them and then just erase it uh, with a light pencil mark. So that was the first failure. And we got to try this check again, dexterity. Ah, second failure. Only one failure left. No more luck tokens. But this is also like the most difficult job because it's the big heist. So, um, no, we fail. All right, so we are discovered. The big heist goes wrong. The job is a complete failure. And now what you would do is, well, we can do that. So if you fail a job, you roll a d6 and on a one and two, you will lose one of your renown. But since we don't have any renown yet, it doesn't matter. But it says here, lose one renown down to a minimum of zero. So let's just roll for the heck of it um, to see if we would also lose one renown. And that was our fourth action, completing the trying to complete the job. And of course, you know my luck, we would also lose one renown, but we don't have any renown yet. All right, so yeah, that was the first little gameplay video of the project I'm working on at the moment. Um, I'm uh, still fine tuning, so um, yeah. I will play a couple of more sessions, but maybe not on camera. And um, yeah, you will know when it's ready. But um, yeah, you can uh, maybe leave a comment if you're interested in this kind of stuff or not and what you think of it so far. I mean, it's not that different from, from Outlaws in the Outer Fringe. So if you got Outlaws in the Outer Fringe and you can do this conversion basically on the fly with the guidelines included there, you wouldn't need this, but if you want it all in one coherent package, um, you could just um, pick that up if you wanted to, if it's ready. All right, so um, that is it for uh, this video. I hope you liked it, even though it's still star dark kind of stuff. But um, yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. So um, yeah. As always, thank you for watching and um, I hope you will have a wonderful weekend, but I'm determined to upload another video on the weekend, something different, something else. Um, no Star Dark uh, because I'm thinking or not thinking, I want to participate in the uh, solo uh, role playing challenge by Caverna do Leques for the month of June. So if you remember, um, he posts a challenge for every month of the year and in April I participated, in May I didn't get to it, uh, in April it was tarot cards and now the challenge will be to just use an oracle but no system. So that's going to be interesting. So I will be doing that and um, yeah, so have a wonderful start into your weekend as always. Thank you for watching and I will see you hopefully in the next video. Bye bye.